Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis, where our secret cabal of alien reptilian overlords have directed us to talk about an interesting, uh, an interesting topic for tonight, conspiracy theories. And joining us is Arthur Goldwag, and we're going to talk all about some wacky stuff coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, Father Tony Sylvia here, and joining me is my co-host, Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. So we've got a really fun topic tonight. We're going to talk about conspiracy theories, and to join, to, uh, joining us to talk about conspiracy theories is a uh, conspiracy theory researcher, Arthur Goldwag. Hello, Arthur. Welcome to the show. Hello. Good to be here. So uh, let's get right into it. How would you describe, how would you define uh, conspiracy theory? Um, my basic definition is that it's a totalizing, unfalsifiable theory that explains history in terms of the machinations of a secret group that benefit by something. Hmm. Um, the, uh, the, the um, philosopher of science, Karl Popper, has a, a great definition of what he called the conspiracy theory of society <laughs> that I'm going to read for a second. All right. um, he described conspiracy theories as the secularization of religious superstition, which mm -hmm. is the more you get into conspiracy theories, the more you see that, that they're, they're a kind of practical theology. But anyway, the, um, just to read, I'm not going to do a lot of reading, but just the, the, read the popper. The view that an explanation of a social phenomenon consists in the discovery of the men or groups who are interested in the occurrence of this phenomenon and who have planned and conspired to bring it about. Um, and then Popper goes on to say what I always go on to say whenever I write about conspiracy theories or talk about them. I do not wish to imply that conspiracies never happen. On the contrary, they are typical social phenomena. They become important, for example, whenever people who believe in the conspiracy theory get into power. And people who sincerely believe that they know how to make heaven on earth are most likely to adopt the conspiracy theory and to get involved in a counter-conspiracy against non-existing conspirators. For the only explanation of their failure to produce their heaven is the evil intention of the devil who has a vested interest in hell. And I would add, um, part of the reason that I would say that conspiracy theories are theological is because of the nature of the theories, and part of it is because they really are about heaven and hell. You're talking about absolutely bad people and absolutely good people. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think there's a lot in there that we can unpack. Uh, I wanted to, s I latched on right away to the word um, unfalsifiable in, in that uh, initial definition. Can you explain why that's important to a conspiracy theory? Well, it's, it is a conspiracy theory. When, when something's on, uh, if, um, you know, if you, you, no evidence will conv will convince you that there, there is no evidence if i say but you know here's a book that that says that this didn't happen they say well you know the conspiracy the conspirators arranged to have that book published mm -hmm. um you say but it's based on independent research and they say well actually it's not independent research one of the researchers was bought off by this person and it it it, it you can the, the conspiracies get unimaginably huge if it takes uh, a million people and not one of them ever revealing the conspiracy mm -hmm. then the conspiracy theorists will say okay there's a million people involved um and you know in the the classic example of conspiracy theory in our day is 9-11 truth mm -hmm. um and when you say look there were um you know there were air traffic controllers, there, there were police, there were firemen, there were the security people inside the building, there were, um, 
you know, how could nobody have 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 revealed this? They'd you know they'd say, well, that's exactly the nature of the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it isn't just crazy stuff where you see conspiracy theory. Um, you know, you see it in climate science denial. Mm-hmm. All of the scientists are on the take. They're doing <laughs> it for the money. Because um, that's what but, I think of when I think of climate scientists. I think filthy rich. Well, but, you know, <laughs> I'm a, you can actually, you can see my house from here. It's not that fancy. <laughs> but I've, you know, I've read about myself that I'm on the Rockefeller payroll or I'm oh. on the Rothschild payroll. <laughs> and again, that's that's conspiracy theory. It, it um, It's totalizing. It's it's all or nothing. A conspiracy is a very different thing, and conspiracies really do happen all the time, um, and we know about them, and that's one of the differences between conspiracies and conspiracy theory. Um, conspiracies fall apart. Mm-hmm. Conspiracies get discovered. The only people who discover conspiracy theories are conspiracy theorists who using the tools that they learn from Kabbalah or using the it's usually they're not investigative tools they're usually um, they're usually cryptological tools um, mm-hmm. because conspiracy theorists believe that the demonic people that are committing the conspiracies are signing them that that, that they're giving all kinds of clues mm-hmm. so like the um, when the Masons built America, they, they laid out the streets of Washington D.C. in in the form of a magic grid and so on. And you can, you know, you can look at an aerial map and 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 see it. And I know you're, we're going to talk about the Da Vinci Code later, but that's you know what the hero of the Da Vinci Code is a, is a cryptologist mm-hmm. and he he solves all these things. Right. That's uh, that's very interesting. And, and uh, full disclosure, you know, uh, I am I'm a Mason and a Martinist and all kinds of other interesting things. And um, I can assure you that uh, you know we don't really control much of anything. We barely control ourselves. So uh, <laughs> yeah, this, I, this, this I, show I, is gonna is gonna drive every conspiracy <laughs> just crazy. So we have a Freemason uh, interviewing an agent of the uh, Rothschilds. Yep. <laughs> uh, Arthur, I, I wanted to ask you, and, and you basically already touched on this, uh, the, the popper quote that you uh, read reminded me a lot of a, of a quote from uh, Umberto Lecco, who says that the conspiracy theory takes the place of God in our secular society because yeah, I... it, gives, it gives meaning to the life, uh, and it shows that there is no accidents, and it shows that there's a plan to to the universe and to the world that we live in, even if that plan is negative. Do you do you believe this is why why people believe um, conspiracy theories? Because it does give existential meaning to one's life. Uh, one of the things I've I've written is that conspiracy theorists like to characterize themselves as skeptics. They're actually great, great believers. They're the most, you know, they're they have a childlike faith in things, and um, there's no accidents, and they're not in the dark. They they um, and so yeah. I mean, I think Echo is brilliant, and I. Um, before I, I started writing Cults, Conspiracies, and Secret Societies, I, I read very carefully the um, Foucault's Pendulum. Mm-hmm. Um, not as, as research, but just so that I could put myself... What, what, what I love about Echo is, is that he puts himself in the heads of, of these people so well. He takes them as seriously as they take themselves. And he's as erudite about junk philosophy as he is about real philosophy. Yeah, the, um, I, th- I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of overlap between uh, people who are interested in kind of alternative spiritualities, I'd say, and, and conspiracy theorists. At least I, I see it a lot in Gnosticism and, um, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to destroy anybody's pet theory. Uh, <laughs> But we do see a lot of interesting uh, overlaps. W- one thing that I <clears throat> wouldn't necessarily consider 
a conspiracy theory, although maybe it is, I'm not entirely sure, but there's the, um, the, the mythicist position of, uh, you know, Jesus never really existed and uh, all we're really talking about is um, rehash stories of older mythologies and, and things like that. And um, <clears throat> in a certain sense for, for a Gnostic, I don't think that's terribly important. Um, you know, whether you, that's your theory of it or if it's, uh, you know, you believe that there was a literal Jesus or, or that kind of thing. But um, there, are some, uh, there are some pretty interesting ones that get connected to Gnosticism, uh, specifically, um, you know, shape-shifting, lizard, alien, reptilian overlord people that get thrown around. When, whenever you Google the term Gnosticism, sometimes you see that. And, uh, and that kind of thing. Is, do you see a connection or, with, between um, people who have alternative spiritual beliefs and, and conspiracy theorists uh, more so in, than in the general population? Or is that something that's just, uh, you're gonna get that wherever you go? Um, I'm gonna say something a little counterintuitive now. Okay. Um, the, the answer is yes, but, but I wanna get at it in, in, in a different way. Um, I think a lot of the the neo gnostic stuff and in, in the um, a lot of the occultist and alchemical stuff, the the Rosicrucianism and the things that the, the esoteric masons drew on. I think that comes out of um, I think that was the in a way that was the science of its day, mm. in that it wasn't what the church was telling people. Um, and then in the Age of Enlightenment, you have masonry arising both as a kind of, you know, su supremely rationalist, free-thinking ideology, but it's also, it's willing to look at things that the church hasn't wanted to look at. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's interested in, in consciousness you know all of this the the the, the hermeticism and the the pseudo egyptian mysticisms and so on they're all and neoplatonism for that matter it's all about it's all about raising consciousness so i think that the impulse the the, the impulse to 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 look at things in a different way than convention tells you to look at them is like the first part of science. Um, where it falls apart with conspiracy theorists is that they don't turn that skepticism on themselves. Mm -hmm. And they become dogmatists. And you see that in religion. And I think, you know, genuinely religious people, um, certainly mystical, mystically religious people, will use religion as a pejorative. They'll say, oh, this person's religious, mm. meaning that they, you know, they go to church and they listen to whatever they're told. They don't think, they don't quest, they don't, they don't, they're not interested in transcendence. So I think it's very important when, and it also again in the spirit of Echo, taking these people as seriously as they take themselves, the point isn't that they're stupid and deluded, um, although many conspiracy theorists are. Um, <laughs> the, the, the point is, you know, that, that that they're trying to see things that they're 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 trying to understand, and they're willing to ask really important questions. Um, in my writing, what I keep finding in conspiracy theory is that. You know, it's connected, well, and um, Gnostic religiosity, too. It can be connected to cultism, which is, a you know, an expression of power. Uh, the, the, it, it's, it's not that the ideas in the cults are necessarily so terrible. It's that the leader of the cult is, is, is using it to control people. Mm -hmm. And it, it also gets connected to right-wing politics because um, uh, to reactionary politics, to, um, you know, the, 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 to demagogic politics. The way that you get people to your cause is you say, you know, I know who's out to get you, <laughs> and I will, I will save you, but I will also point out who the enemy is. 
And, you know, no one else will say it, but I'll say it. The enemy is, it's the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. It's the Jews. It's the Masons. It's the bankers. It's Muslims. It's Talmud. It's Sharia. But whatever it is, we have it. And then when you define it, it ends up looking exactly like um, it, it ends up looking like the devil because the devil is always the opposite of good and whatever your definition of good is the conspirators are the absolute opposite of that mm -hmm. and if say you're a human being then the um, I mean kind of the ultimate conspiracy theory is that you know the 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 nemesis is an alien. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a warm-blooded mammalian human being, then the nemesis is a reptile. And it's remarkable, I mean, how tied into Gnosticism it is. Um, you know, the people that write this stuff, they're very imaginative. Mm -hmm. And I, I most, mostly what I had read was the... Um, you know the 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 stuff from um like graham hancock and people like that that relate it to to egyptian lore mm -hmm. or, or to canonical biblical stories um but i was just reading this afternoon preparing for this interview about how the gospel of philip lays out all the um all the different kinds of extraterrestrials, the greys, and the, um, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, it, as if it's real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, and when you get into the world of conspiracy theory, as, as people always discover to their amazement, Ho Hofstadter and the paranoid style of American politics, he's like, you know, my God, it's so footnoted. <laughs> um, and, you know, the um, Robert Welch of the John Birch Society, he'd write these these insane, obsessive books, and they'd have thousands and thousands of footnotes. And what's interesting is that the footnotes are all to other conspiracy theory books. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's Nesta Webster, and um, or some you know somebody somebody like that. And Nesta Webster has millions of footnotes. And she's reading some history of, of some anti-Masonic book from the 19th century. Maybe she's reading um, maybe she's reading one of Leo Taxel's books, which isn't even real. <laughs> but, but, but nonetheless, there it is in a footnote. And you know, it, <laughs> it's it's not just an attempt to see through conventional reality but to construct an alternative reality um i mean i i find it fascinating um and then the the, the final thing i would say is um with conspiracy theory and with some gnostic ideas as they get expressed in popular culture um very hard to tell apart from very florid paranoia mm. um you know the phil deck is the the the, the great gnostic right. author. and i actually the first job i had after i dropped out of graduate school i worked for his agent and he was it was the last year of his life and they were making blade runner which was the first um was the first one of his option books that was getting made into a movie mm -hmm. And he didn't live to, I don't think he lived to see it come out, or he, okay. he refused to let them, he, they, they were republishing Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep as a movie tie-in, and he refused to let them put the name Blade Runner on yeah. it. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't that into the movie. <laughs> but then, you know, but then there were a thousand Philip Dick movies after that. Right, right. And, um, Vallis is a, you know, it, He's a very sick man, but he's maybe also an inspired man. There's a fine and, line, isn't there? Well, a very fine line, and a lot of really, you know, a lot of really significant literature is about religious madness, because mm -hmm. you, you can't, I mean, I guess you know them by their fruits. <laughs> um, and if, if they're brilliant, 
and if they lead a, a really good life and if they you know okay then you're talking about a mystic and if they're Lyndon LaRouche or something then you're not talking about a mystic but a lot of cult leaders also start out with the best intentions and right. you know if Jim Jones had been hit by a bus in 1959 then the people of Indianapolis would have remembered him as a very idealistic minister who did good works. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, but uh, we have some more time to talk about this during our podcast. So um, <clears throat> just want to tease a couple of things that we'll talk about in the podcast coming out a few days after this video. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Leo Taxel, who got mentioned earlier, and, and Lyndon LaRouche. and, and um, I, I think we'll get into some interesting uh, tie-ins between the Gnostic creation myths and, uh, and some conspiracy theories that surround that. So uh, keep an eye on your podcast feed for that. Links in the description below this video. Uh, coming up on Talk Gnosis, I wanted to also mention that uh, next week we will have uh, Bishop Tim Mansfield, uh, one of my favorite human beings on the planet, going to talk about temple theology and the origins of Gnosticism. Thank you, Jonathan, for setting that up. I know that's a topic that you're... A f you're a fan of as well, so yes, gonna, yeah, it's it's going to be a great show. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, do you have any news that uh, didn't make the rundown here that I didn't write down? Uh, no, I I think we got it all. As always, uh, uh, excitement coming to Arlington, Massachusetts. I have to learn how to say your stage. No, but, uh, you don't have to. But we, I'll take you yeah. to I'll take you to all the places that have names that you'll never know what they. It'll be it'll be fun. Uh, for the uh, for the AJC Conclave in May, it's uh, they recently uh, lowered the price, uh, and it's going to be uh, just an amazing time with uh, some some real uh, uh, top notch speakers. So, yep, everybody go to that. Yep. So uh, joeandite.org slash conclave2016 is the link for that. Uh, the whole week is now only $300, but you're going to have to find your own lodging now. So that's uh, so you know hit up Airbnb or whatever and. And come join us for that uh, May 12th through the 17th. That's going to be a good time. All right. So I think that that's a good place to wrap it up. We're going to uh, continue our conversation here on the podcast. So uh, check that out if, and subscribe if you haven't already using your favorite podcast aggregator. And uh, for those of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom uh -huh. Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c. Thank <music> you.